Hello everybody. So now we continue with this course of Fourier series and Fourier transforms. But the new part, the new chapter that we begin is Sturm level problems and partial differential equations and generalized Fourier expansions. So we can think of this as the third part of the course. The first three chapters constitute classical Fourier analysis of Fourier series. The second part was a slightly long chapter on Fourier transforms and now we leave these classical parts of Fourier analysis and we look at generalized Fourier expansions. So what is special about this orthogonal system 1 cos x sin x cos 2x sin 2x etc on L2 of minus pi pi. Are there other interesting or useful orthogonal systems? For example, let us take L2 of minus 1, 1. That's a Hilbert space. We've got a sequence of Legendre polynomials, P0x, P1x, P2x. These are going to be polynomials on minus 1, 1. Pnx is going to be a polynomial of degree exactly n. And one would argue that polynomials are nice objects. And so these polynomials will form a more interesting orthogonal system. Orthogonal means integral from minus 1 to 1 p n x p m x dx is 0 if m is not equal to n. So they are orthogonal with respect to the L2 inner product. On L2 of the real line we have the Hermite functions. We have encountered the Hermite functions in the chapter on Fourier transforms. But these Hermite functions will form a orthogonal system of functions. And then let's look at other examples. Before we take other examples, let us give a general definition. H is a separable Hilbert space. Separable Hilbert space means it's a Hilbert space first and foremost. Being a Hilbert space, it's a metric space. It should be a separable metric space. It must have a countable dense subset. Okay, so H is a separable Hilbert space. And you're taking a subset B which is phi1, phi2, da da da, phi n, da da da, display 5.1. It's an orthogonal system of non-zero vectors. Orthogonal means that phi i and phi j are orthogonal in the Hilbert space if i is not equal to j, the inner product is zero. And second requirement is that the linear span of B is dense in H. Remember that if I have a set of vectors in a vector space which are mutually perpendicular, then these vectors are linearly independent. Remember that I have expressly said that B consists of non-zero vectors. So you've got a bunch of non-zero vectors which are mutually perpendicular, they'll be linearly independent and the linear span must be dense in H and this B is a sequence. So you say that this B is a orthogonal system in my Hilbert space. It's a countable orthogonal system. We say that B is a complete orthogonal system. Completeness basically refers to the fact that the linear span of B is dense. So this definition has two components, the orthogonality component and the closure of the linear span in H. The closure of the linear span in H refers to the completeness. So the results of chapter 2 say that 1 comma cos x sin x cos 2x sin 2x da 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 is a complete orthogonal system in L2 of minus pi pi. Now of course just as the theory of classical Fourier series is very vast we can ask what about general orthogonal systems of functions in a Hilbert space and complete orthogonal systems. The literature is quite vast. I'm going to give you one reference which is by now quite a classic. It is Giovanni Sanson orthogonal functions. A Dover publication was issued in 1991. It's a very good book and a very fairly comprehensive and a very readable account of the general theory of orthogonal systems of functions in Hilbert spaces. So first let's ask why should we generalize classical Fourier series? Why should we study these kinds of generalized orthogonal systems, complete orthogonal systems in Hilbert spaces? There are several different reasons and I listed many of them. First of all, they arise in 
several parts of analysis. First thing is approximation theory. Approximation theory concerns with the following problem. What is Weierstrass approximation theorem? Weierstrass approximation theorem says that the polynomials are dense in C01. I'm just for simplicity looking at my interval to be 01. You can work with any compact interval. The Weierstrass approximation theorem says that with respect to the supremum norm, the sup norm, polynomials are dense in uh, C of 0. Every continuous function can be approximated by polynomial. What is the philosophy of approximation theory? You got a vector space, right? In this case, the vector space is a set of all continuous functions. And we've got a convenient subspace, a convenient subspace W consisting of polynomials. The question is, can you approximate elements of the larger vector space V, the ambient vector space V by members in the subspace W. With respect to some norm in the context of Weierstrass approximation theorem, it is a sup norm. Second question and a more important question is that how good are these approximations? Suppose for example, I take the set of all polynomials of degree say 10 and I give you a continuous function f. And f has to be approximated by polynomials of degree 10. What is the best possible approximation that I can achieve? For the case of Hilbert spaces, in the classical Fourier series in chapter 2, we got the least square approximation. That's a classic illustration of the kind of problems that we study in approximation theory. So approximation theory itself is a very active area of research. Now, the second application is to solving boundary value problems in partial differential equations. We have seen examples of this in chapter 2 and 3 where we solved the, the Laplace's equation on a disk in two dimensions. We obtained the Poisson kernel. That's only one example and there are many such examples, a very vast theory. The third illustration is Wavelets and image processing, how general orthogonal systems of functions such as the Haar system of functions arise in context of image processing. And wavelets are another examples. And Strichartz's book which I cited earlier is an excellent place to begin learning about wavelets. Just a very short introduction but a very good introduction. I already mentioned to you that Strichartz is a book that you must start reading when you're finished with this course. And in about seven or eight pages, he explains some of the ideas centering around wavelets and image processing. Then comes probability theory. I will cite the book of K. R. Parthasarathy, Introduction to Probability and Measure, Hindustan Book Agency 2005, to see how Hilbert space techniques and complete orthogonal systems appear in study of probability theory. Problems in geometric function theory. Let me explain to you what these problems are. Now, what does the Riemann mapping theorem tell you? You take a general simply connected domain omega such that omega is not the whole complex plane. So take a simply connected domain in C other than the complex domain and I can find a holomorphic function f from omega to mod z less than 1 which is 1, 1 and on 2. This is the Riemann mapping theorem. The Riemann mapping theorem is an existence theorem and the popular way you prove the Riemann mapping theorem is using ascoli arzela theorem and stuff like that. The problem is that this proof doesn't give you any indication as to how to find this mapping which does the job. This is usually done using a Hilbert space of square integrable functions. So what you do is that you take the domain omega and you take those holomorphic functions that are square integrable. That is, you take holomorphic functions, call it h omega, intersect L2 of omega. L2 of omega is a Hilbert space and those holomorphic functions on omega which are in L2 of omega that forms a closed subspace. It's a closed subspace of a separable Hilbert space, so it is also separable. Let us call this space A2 omega. Those holomorphic functions such that integral mod f squared dx dy is finite. So this is the separable Hilbert space and you take an orthonormal basis 
f1, f2, f3, da da da, and you construct a certain function called the kernel function from this. And the kernel function gives you information about the Riemann mapping. A very nice introduction to these things is Zeev Nehari's conformal mappings published by Dover in 1975. Particularly, you should look at page 239 to 265. And in these pages 258 to 260, Nehari explains how Chebyshev's polynomials of the second kind can be used to map a ellipse which is slit from the two foci to the two extremities onto the unit disk. So the use of Chebyshev's polynomials of the second kind is explained in these pages 258 to 260. So I have given you several diverse applications of general orthogonal systems, complete orthogonal systems in Hilbert spaces and we must develop a Fourier analysis of these. So now let us take a Hilbert space H with a complete orthonormal system as I explained earlier B equal to phi 1 comma phi 2 comma phi n da 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 such that the phi i and phi j are orthogonal if i is not equal to j and none of the functions are zero. We are looking at non-zero elements in the Hilbert space. It is customary to normalize these functions and look at phi n by norm phi n. Display 5.2 n equal to 1, 2, 3, etc. We have a complete orthonormal system. You have got a complete orthogonal system of elements in H, phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, dot, dot, dot. Then every element x can be written as c1 phi1 plus c2 phi2 plus dot 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 plus c and phi1. In what sense does this infinite series 5.3 converge? The convergence of 5.3 is the sense of the Hilbert space norm. It is displayed in the last part of the slide. Limit as n tends to infinity, the nth partial sum c1 phi1 plus c2 phi2 plus dot 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 plus c and phi n must converge to x in the Hilbert space norm. So in that sense, we talk about the equality 5.3. The coefficients cj can be uniquely determined. How do you determine it? Very simple. You simply take the inner product of both sides with respect to phi j. So you will get x inner product with phi j. In the right hand side, you will get cj norm phi j squared. So what is my cj? cj is nothing but inner product of x with phi j divided by norm phi j square. This determination of cj's is exactly the analog or the generalization of the formulas in chapter 1. What are the formulas in chapter 1? A n equal to 1 upon pi integral minus pi to pi f of x cos n x dx. B n equal to 1 upon pi integral minus pi to pi f of x sin n x dx and a naught is what? 1 upon 2 pi integral minus pi to pi f x dx. We got those formulas for a naught, a n's and b n's and what I told you just now about the c j's is the generalization of those and these coefficients c1, c2, c3 are called the Fourier coefficients of x with respect to the given orthogonal system. Again, one can develop a Bessel's inequality and a Parseval formula associated with 5.3. I again repeat that these orthogonal systems are supposed to be complete. And what I talked about the coefficients has now been displayed as 5.4 in this slide. We shall return to these general discussions on Hilbert spaces and move on to boundary value problems in partial differential equations. So let us begin by looking at the vibrations of a circular membrane. Let us consider a circular membrane clamped along its rim. You can take the radius of the membrane to be 1 for simplicity and the a mean position being measured along the xy plane. So for example, when the membrane is in equilibrium, when there is no vibrations at all, the membrane is along the xy plane and the center of the membrane is the origin and and the time axis is the third variable. Now what happens is that the membrane is set into vibrations and what is the displacement of the membrane 
at the point x y at time t that displacement is z of x comma y comma t and so this z of x y t must satisfy the wave equation how do you derive this wave equation from newtonian mechanics the derivation is there in several books for example krayzig's advanced engineering mathematics that's the 8th edition page 616 to 618 the krayzig has undergone several editions and uh, please pay attention to the edition number i am talking the 8th edition and these are the pages if you take a different edition the pages will be different so that is equation 5.5 uh, that you see in the display c is the velocity of the wave usually you will take c to be constant if your membrane has uniform membrane if your membrane is not a uniform membrane the c itself could be a function of x and y we will assume that c is constant because we want to keep the introduction simple we seek a special solution of the form z equal to a cos pt plus b sin pt times u of xy these are like standing waves now we substitute this ansatz into the equation 5.5 when you substitute this into equation 5.5 what happens the right hand side gives you what the right hand side gives you minus a p squared cos p t minus b p squared sin p t u of x y what happens to left hand side this a cos p t plus b sin p t is left as it is the laplacian falls on u so you get c squared a cos pt plus b sin pt times the laplacian of u equal to minus p squared a cos pt plus b sin pt u this let's cancel out this a cos pt plus b sin pt and we see that the u component of the solution satisfies the differential equation laplacian of u plus k squared u equal to 0 this is called the reduced wave equation or the hemholtz equation and k is p by c a few comments are in order and they'll be given as exercises now because the membrane is circular we must write this equation in polar coordinates remember that when a physical system admits a symmetry you must exploit the symmetry only then you will be able to do your analysis efficiently so here the vibrating membrane exhibits circular symmetry so you should write the laplace in, in polar coordinates if you for example study the hydrogen atom and you look at the schrodinger's equation for the hydrogen atom then the space around the hydrogen atom is isotropic and so it ex exhibits rotational symmetry so you should write the laplacian in the schrodinger's equation in spherical polar coordinates here we are talking about plane polar coordinates that is exercise number 1 write the laplace's operator delta in plane polar coordinates the next exercise is meant for those who have greater tenacity in doing things write the laplace's operator in r3 in spherical polar coordinates computations can get very cumbersome unless you use some cleverness if you cannot do this i'll give you a reference one good place to see this is gibson's elementary treatises in the calculus where the spherical polar coordinates is written as a composition of two plane polar coordinates it's a two fold application of the plane polar coordinate system and you use this and then you'll be able to write the laplace in r3 very efficiently if you try to directly do it it will run into several pages and it's likely that you may make some mistakes but that's a optional exercise the hemholtz's equation in plane polar coordinates reads del 2u by del r squared plus 1 upon r del u by del r plus 1 upon r squared del 2u by del theta squared plus k squared u equal to 0 that is display 5.8 that you see in front of you now what we must do is that we must try to look for a solution which depends only on the radial coordinate suppose we are looking at vibrations which are radial vibrations there is a u is a function of r alone then what happens or more generally you could look for 
a separation of variables, you could write a general solution u of r theta equal to v of r cos n theta. If theta is 0, you get pure radial vibrations. Now let us do this more general case and then let us look at the special case when n equal to 0. Now what happens is that n must be an integer. Why must n be an integer? Because this u of r theta is a function of x and y. So the theta will only appear in terms of cos and sine. And so if n is not an integer, then you will not get a 2 pi periodic function. So whereas u is 2 pi periodic as a function of theta because it appears only in terms of cos theta and sin theta. So n must be an integer. Okay, so now substitute this ansatz into the reduced wave equation and you separate the variables. The radial part V will satisfy this ODE R squared V double prime plus R V prime plus K squared R squared minus N squared V equal to 0. That is equation 5.9. That's an easy exercise for you to do. Now, of course, when you look at purely radial vibrations, N is 0. N is 0 means this N will drop out and one R will drop out of the equation and 5.9 will simplify. This is the Bessel's equation. 5.9 is essentially the Bessel's equation after scaling. If you put kr equal to s in the differential equation, that's the standard Bessel's equation. We can now look for a Frobenius series solution of the Bessel's equation. Remember that we already discussed this in the very first chapter. We looked at the Bessel's functions of the first kind and we looked for a Frobenius series solution and I told you about the indicial equation. The indicial equation for this 5.9 is rho squared minus n squared and the positive index will give you a solution which is finite at the origin. It has two solutions. One solution will behave like r to the power n. The other solution will behave like r to the power minus n. Remember that when r is 0, you are at the center of the membrane. Now, we are looking at finite vibrations of the membrane. So the center of the membrane is displaced only to a finite extent. So the solution which behaves like r to the power minus n is not physically relevant. Physically relevant solution is that solution which behaves like r to the power n near the origin. And that is the Bessel's function of the first kind. And so the solution is J N K R. At this juncture, if you have forgotten these things, you must go back to the first chapter and consult the definition of J N X, which we defined as an infinite series. I told you to compute the radius of convergence of the infinite series and so on and so forth. And so the physically tenable solution is J N K R. So we have found the V R part, namely it is Jn of Kr. More general solutions can be obtained by superposition. So our special solution that we obtained is Zxyt is the V part cos n theta. And remember the A cos Ckt plus B sin Ckt, P was Ck or K was P upon C. Remember, since the membrane is clamped at the rim, there is points on the boundary of the membrane are not getting displaced. You can think of a tabla. A tabla is an example of a membrane which is clamped along the rim. And we assume that the radius of the membrane is r equal to 1. So when I put r equal to 1 in this equation, it must be identically 0. And so we immediately get the condition that the relevant k are the roots of the Bessel's function. So we must look at j and k equal to 0. This equation j and k equal to 0 has infinitely many roots and these roots form an increasing sequence and it goes off to infinity. And each 0 is a simple 0. We shall see later how to prove that the Bessel's function has infinitely many zeros. We will use the integral representations that we obtained in the first chapter due to Schlomilch. We obtained the Schlomilch's formula and using Schlomilch's formula and Fourier series, we got the integral representation of the Bessel's function. We will use the integral representation to prove that the Bessel's function has infinitely many zeros. And then we can get more general solutions by superpositions. 
I think this is a very good place to stop this capsule. We'll continue this in the next capsule. Thank you very much.